my name is uh, Gunnar Jakobsson and I am an infection disease physician, infectious disease doctor working in the hospital in Skövde and also a member of the so-called Strama group in Sweden. Everybody who knows this uh, concept of Strama, raise your hand. Well, that's not so many. Uh, Strama stands for the Swedish Strategic Group Against uh, Antibiotic Resistance. And I'm also uh, chairman of the Regional Antibiotic Committee, the committee who issues um, guidelines on antibiotic treatment, both for primary care and for uh, the hospitals. And I feel sorry for you to have me as a lecturer because my friends say I'm half deaf, but I hear something. And I'm not so good at uh, English, so you will have a patience with me. But feel free to ask questions and uh, any comments, maybe I can answer. So my task here today is to talk about uh, the clinical consequences of uh, antibiotic resistance. And I can say increased mortality, increased morbidity, and that's all. But I will talk a little bit more about uh, the consequences. This is my agenda, and don't be afraid, I don't will go into any details about this. This is more for my structure, for my memory. Okay, I will start to quote WHO in their report from 2014, talking about a post-antibiotic era. Minor injuries can kill. And they say it's not far from being an apocalyptic fantasy. Uh, and it's a real thing in the 21st century. Well, this has been criticized. It's, we don't live in a post-antibiotic era. And we will not do it for several years. But in some parts of the world, the crisis is much more worse than we have in our high-income country. And 2015, WHO made another report, its so-called Global Action Plan on Antibiotic Resistance. And they encourage every country to have a national action plan against antibiotic resistance. And Sweden has one, but many countries, especially in low- and middle-income countries don't have any uh, national action plans. They must prioritize other things. Well, WHO says, when microbes become resistant to medicine, the options for treating the diseases they cause are reduced. Of course, that's no, not strange. This resistance to antimicrobial medicines is happening in all parts of the world. And this is important. I will come back to this different consequences in different settings. For a broad range of microorganisms, or you can say illnesses or diseases with an increasing prevalence that threatens human and animal health. I don't uh, go to talk anything about animal health. Um, the direct consequences of infection with resistant microorganisms can be severe including longer illnesses, increased mortality, prolonged stays in hospital, loss of protection for patients undergoing surgery and other medical procedures and increased cost. And all these consequences are different in different countries, in different settings, in different burden of infection and different burden of resistant infection. So you can never talk about a country like Sweden, a high-income country, at the same time as you talk about Bangladesh and uh, India, for example. And antimicrobial resistance affects all areas of health, involves many sectors and has an impact on the whole of society. But I am going to talk about consequences in healthcare. Yeah, increased mortality. 
And this report from ECDC, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, it's an authority, European authority. You can say in Sweden we have Folkhälsomyndigheten is the same, performing the same task with surveillance of infectious diseases. And they estimate 25,000 Europeans die each year, this report from 2009. And of course, this is a very rough estimate because you can die because of a resistant infection, but you can also die with an resistant infection. And that's not the same thing. If you're old and have several what we call comorbidities, chronic illnesses, will die in any way. But maybe you die with a resistant infection. And another report from 2015 by the ECDC, they now had a higher estimate of more than 30,000 uh, there's because of a resistant infection. But they also tried to estimate the morbidity. And they used a measure of a dollar's disability adjusted uh, <clears throat> love years caused by infection with resistant bacteria. And this will be a theme in my lecture, this map over Europe. And why Europe? Because we have a lot of data from Europe. Europe is not much the worst afflicted area in the world, but in other areas, we don't have so much data on resistance as we have in, in Europe. And the common theme is also this gradient from the north to the south and sometimes from the west to the east. And in the mean number of dollars per 100,000 is 170 in Europe. And you see some countries much more afflicted by resistant infection. The last thing I would like to um, see, maybe during my vacation, is an intensive care unit in Italy or Greece. I don't want to see it as a patient because it's a very great risk of acquiring a resistant infection in this uh, intensive care unit. Do you understand uh, when I say intensive care unit? Yeah. And this is uh, another estimate in the future, 2050, how many deaths there will be of resistant infection. And this is a report from uh, 2014, the so-called uh, O'Neill report, and it would have been a lot debated and criticized because it just estimates. But what's important with this figure is not the exact numbers, but you see Europe not a problem. The problem is low and middle income countries in Asia and Africa. So when you talk about uh, all parts of the world, you must define, is it a high or low resistance settings? Is it a high or low burden of infections? And what about the resource setting? This is mortality rate in the US because of infectious diseases from 1900 to 2000. And of course, it's been a decline. But what the interesting with this, uh, this uh, slide is that here is uh, its first use of penicillin in the beginning of the 40s. And you see this decline before we introduced antibiotics of penicillin. And this decline in mortality is because of uh, better living conditions, clean water, toilets, and so on. So we should not expect so much of antibiotics compared to those other things. And if you look, for example, in South Asia, South Asia now have around 400, 500 deaths per 100,000 in infectious diseases. So maybe the best thing we can do here 
It's of course as uh, India are doing right now, toilets and uh, clean water and so on. And if you look for sub-Saharan, we're up here. And about the resources, uh, how many doctors, how many nurses do we have uh, in the country? And this uh, figures, if you look at the US, 12 doctors and nurses per 1,000 population in Europe, nearly 10, compared to Sub-Saharan Africa, 1. And many doctors, nurses, doctors more educated in Africa going to Europe and US working. So there are brain drainage. This is a map of the so-called drug resistant index for 2015. And uh, the important thing is all the country where there is no color, we have no data, but where we do have data, the problem is among low and middle income countries, India, and you see the north-south gradient in, uh, in Europe. But of course, the problem is uh, biggest in the low-income countries and middle-income countries. So you have these two examples of South Asia and Tanzania. You have a high burden of infections, you have poor resources, and you have high resistance. And this awful figure of one child dying every second minute and these newborn children with uh, sepsis with a very high mortality. And this is irrespective if you talk about resistant infections or called sensitive infection, but the resistance adds on this problem. And many uh, children don't get any uh, antibiotic for a common uh, disease like uh, pneumonia, irrespective of resistant or not resistant infection. <coughs> but this is the fact. Okay, you should be aware of um, the difference between uncomplicated versus complicated infections especially in times where you have resistance and you will have so-called non-appropriate therapy, therapy not functioning. Here are examples of uncomplicated infection, relative uncomplicated infection, urinary tract infection, skin and soft tissue infection. And what's the consequence? Yeah, we will have increased morbidity, but not increased mortality. And that's what we're seeing in Sweden, high-income countries, we have problems with treating urinary tract infection, but people are not dying from them. It will be uh, longer treatment times and maybe longer hospital stays, but uh, they will not die. But if we have uh, sepsis, you're familiar with the uh, concept of sepsis, yes, and pneumonia acquired in the hospital, the consequence can be increased mortality. And we don't see that so much in uh, high-income countries, but of course we see it in other countries. Well, I don't understand why I did uh, take this word, but okay, I tried to explain. Uh, this is, um, um, here we have uh, resistance rates from blood, a culture taken for blood in our region, the Land, and here is from urine. And it's from the year 2014 to 2018, and you see it in increasing rates. This is different hospitals, Sorgrenska, uh, Borås, Skövde, Trollhättan. And it's, uh, here it's nearly 20%. And we say when you have so great, big resistant rates, you can't trust a uh, therapy functioning. And you not so much in, in the urine. And this is ciprofloxacin, is a very much used antibiotic for urinary tract infection. 
in real you can say this is the only per oral tablet we have to treat febrile urinary tract infection we have just one choice and that's in sweden <laughs> high income country where we have resistance against this we have problems we have to put patients in the hospital and give them intravenous therapy so the, the, we are lucky but the resistance or rather the consequences of more um, intravenous <coughs> therapy yeah uh, we have different resistance and uh, you had uh, lectures about uh, resistance and um, I'm mostly talking of uh, multi-resistant uh, bacteria and I, I do think you are familiar with this concept yes and this is mandatory reportable uh, antibiotic resistance in Sweden and what I want to show is the biggest problem with this gram-negative intestinal bacteria ESPL. Pneumococci, no, it's no problem because of our new vaccination, mostly. And vancomycin resistant enterococci, no problem. And this is staphylococcus, some problems, but this is the biggest problem. This is to illustrate, this is the biggest problem. Uh, no other connections. And you see this um, north-south uh, gradient again. This is not updated data, but it's from 2014, but it's the same today. So it's problem, a uh, huge problem with the uh, ESPL in the south of uh, Sweden, uh, Europe. Yeah. Gram negative bacteria with ESPL, the most common is E. coli, but you know that. Uh, the bacteria are colonizing the gut and the urine, so you can be, to be totally asymptomatic. You don't have any infection, you just colonized your carrier of a resistant bacteria. But of course, the bacteria can also cause a clinical evident infection. And a wide spectrum of infections, but mostly urinary tract infection and abdominal infection, and sometimes sepsis. Not so often uh, infection acquired in the hospital, nosocomial infection, and infection in immunocompromised people. And we uh, clinicians, a doctor, physician were very interested in risk factors for a resistant infection because when they're coming a patient to the hospital, we want to know do you have a resistant infection or not? Because uh, see, see it on the patient. So there are some clues if there's a resistant uh, infection. Uh, devices. For example, a urinary catheter is a risk factor. Comorbidities, as we say, chronic illnesses. And this is important. Recent antimicrobial therapy, it affects your normal gut flora and resistant bacteria will replace the sensitive, the normal flora. This is very important. Hosp hospitalization because we have a spread of resistant bacteria in our hospitals. This we call in English for infection prevention and control. Prolonged hospitalization and this travel to high risk areas. And this is very popular to do studies about this nowadays. You examine people before they travel abroad and then you examine uh, the afterwards and you compare the percentage resistant before and the percentage resistant after and you do it by examining the faces the, uh, the faces flora and this is a dutch study there's a lot of uh, studies like this dutch study with 2000 travelers and this percentage is the percentage carrier of a resistant infection afterwards and you see here India and Bangladesh uh, it's very common that you bring back a resistant organism in your gut. Uh, 
And what are the risk, risk factors? People often eating raw vegetables or uh, street fast food restaurants, mm-hmm. you can acquire uh, resistant infections. But if you had an evident um, gastrointestinal infection, there's even more a risk of you acquiring a resistant infection. But the most important and a large risk factor is if you have used antibiotic at the same time as you travel because uh, the effect of the gut flora. And there are different uh, antibiotics and those so-called cannulas are the worst. So in your private interest, you should not use antibiotic during travel and not cannulas. Yeah, this is an, an, another example of another study of humanity becoming uh, uh, carriers of resistant infection. Of course, you will don't be a carrier for all your life. You can be here for three months, six months, nine months, but some are carriers after one year. And we don't know who will be a long-term carrier or not. Um, just a short uh, case report. This was a, a physician, and he had problem with the liver turning yellow, some things with the liver or the bile. So undergoing, I don't uh, expect that you know this examination, it's an examination of the bile duct, going down the uh, stomach and the intestine and into the bile duct to see if there's any obstruction of the bile. It's a common procedure in Swedish hospitals. But uh, here it was some problem. He falls ill in some after with sepsis. We do see that sometimes. And he was treated for infection in the bile duct with a broad-spectrum antibiotic, piperacillin and it grew E. coli, a common bacteria in uh, blood culture, but no improvement. And day three, the resistant test uh, told there was an ESPL. And I point out three days to get a result of uh, the resistant. And this, is, uh, this was not in Sweden, but it's a high income country. Ah, of course, they changed the treatment to another broad spectrum um, antibiotics. It stays in hospital 10 days. But six weeks later, the wife is admitted with not bile infection, but infection of one of the kidneys. The same hospital and the same treatment, new improvement, another uh, antibiotic. And she has a problem with obstruction of the urine. So they insert a drainage of the uh, kidney. It's a common procedure. But the culture is spelled equally as the husband. And this is a very long treatment time for a urinary tract infection but because of the resistance. And here is just to prove that it's exactly the same strain of this E. coli ESPL, that this is a consequence of the spread of uh, resistant organisms, even the family. So this is the ESPL implication, increased morbidity, mortality, need for admission to hospital, length of stay, length of treatment, isolation, infection control. Of course, we, we do more this rapid test, knowing if it's a resistant infection and increased information to the patient. Uh, 